Chapter 1 Dora stood between Melody and Mr. Jefferson, focusing all her attention on her wedding vows. She and Melody were having a double wedding ceremony that had been planned for all of ten minutes. She shook a little, not sure how comfortable she felt with Mr. Jefferson, whom she'd only known for an hour, but she was pretty certain she wasn't up to making the rest of the trip to Oregon City. Mr. Jefferson had a farm in Clover Creek, Oregon Territory, and she was pleased to join his household rather than driving the rest of the way to Oregon City. Shortly after she joined the company she had, one of the older sons of a friend had agreed to hitch her oxen for her every day and he'd also taken her shifts on the watch. Doris felt a bit badly for lying to everyone, but it had felt necessary when she'd joined with all the other wagons to go west on the Oregon Trail. She repeated her vows when prompted, and she allowed Mr. Jefferson to kiss her cheek once they were pronounced man and wife. Now she only had to get the belongings she needed from her covered wagon, which would be mostly personal things. Her mother had died in January, which had finally freed her to go west as an emigrant. For the longest time, she'd thought she'd spend the rest of her life doting on her mother and caring for her in her sickness. Doris had just barely finished school when her father died. Her mother had begged and begged her to stay with her and not find a man to marry. Now, thirty years later, she was past childbearing age, and certainly past the age where she was marriageable, as a spinster anyway. But as a widow, the whole world had opened up for her, leaving her free to pursue her dreams. Initially, she had hoped to get her piece of land and perhaps start a boarding house near Oregon City, but the trail had been much harder for her than she'd dreamed it would be. Being introduced to a man who had recently lost his wife was what she'd needed to stop her journey west and marry a stranger. Maybe her life would have been easier if she'd continued her journey, but she was definitely starting to believe the elephant didn't exist. Oregon City was so far away. Dora smiled at her new husband. Should we go and collect my things? Perhaps the lad who has been hitching and unhitching my wagon daily would like to take it with him. Mr. Jefferson, Andrew, as she must remember to call him, nodded. That would be good. Or we could leave it where it is and only take the things you desperately need. And the oxen, of course. I could add your oxen to my dairy farm. I brought only cows, so that would work well. I considered a bull, but they tend to be more obstinate and difficult to drive from what I've been told. Andrew nodded. Let's head out to your wagon and find what you need. I'm a farmer, and you know farmers need to be awake early for their morning chores. Yes, I'll say goodbye to our captain and meet you outside in five minutes. At Andrew's nod, she headed toward where she'd last seen the captain but he was nowhere to be found. The church was overcrowded with the people of Clover Creek, who had made their journey on the Oregon Trail the summer before, and her own company consisting of nineteen wagons and all the people that went with them. Finally, she spotted the kind man on the other side of the church from where she stood. She hurried across the large room to him. Thank you for being willing to take on a widow for the journey. I understand a lot of captains don't. Mr. Stevens nodded, smiling at her. I didn't see a need to keep women from going west alone when the government is happy to give you free land. I still thank you for it. The journey was made much easier by having a captain who wasn't grudging about my presence. She shook his hand. And now I'll get what I need from my wagon. Please let everyone know they may take whatever they find. Thank you for your generosity. Doris hurried out to meet Andrew, not wanting him to be upset with her this early in their marriage. He helped her onto the wagon seat, and they went to the camp, spotting her friend Melody doing the same with Mr. Appleby. Doris needed a few things from her wagon. Most everything in it had been purchased for the journey. She did get the flour, sugar, and jerky she'd purchased that afternoon and she took the small jewelry box her mother had left her and all the clothes she'd brought along. Each thing was handed to Andrew as she found it, and finally, she climbed down from the back of the wagon. Everything else can help the other families in my company, she said softly. 
Andrew nodded, helping her back onto his wagon seat, even though he'd just watched her scramble into the back of her old wagon as if it was the easiest thing to do. Now we'll have to get the cattle, she said. I had each branded on the neck with my initials so they would be easy to tell from the others. Andrew frowned. Why don't I take you home so you can get settled, and I'll borrow my daughter's new brothers-in-law. They've offered to help several times as I've been building my house, so I'm certain they won't mind. That sounds like a good idea. She waited in the wagon as he returned to the church to ask for his needed help. He came out shortly after with a young man who introduced himself as Jared Appleby. I'm going to gather whoever I can, and we'll find the cattle while Mr. Jefferson takes you home. We'll see you in a little while. Andrew climbed into the wagon beside her. He and Roy are going to help and hopefully someone else. I don't know. He did tell me to go home and expect to have extra cows in the morning. Wonderful. That was much easier than it could have been. Andrew nodded. I think we all still have the mentality of the trail. We do what we can for others because we know we'll need them to return the favor in the future. Doris nodded, smiling. That's how my company was as well. I will miss the different women I was with in the evenings, but I will not miss that horrible journey. One of the ladies in our company called it a death march. The description seems as apt as anything else, Andrew said. Did that woman make it? Oh, yes. She's the midwife here. Her oldest daughter married along the trail, but Mrs. Mitchell simply continued along with her family. She complained a lot though. I wanted to complain a lot, Doris said. But I couldn't figure out what that would help, so I stayed as positive as I could in my dealings with others on the trail. He smiled. I understand. I wanted to complain after my wife died. My daughter was a good little homemaker, but married and moved away shortly after her mother died. No point in complaining about a thing, and I'm glad she's happy. Am I right that she married one of Mr. Appleby's sons? Yes, she married his middle son, Sam. He's a good man, and he treats her very well. I'm glad. Doris looked out over the beautiful valley she would live in with him. Do you ever have to go over Big Hill? Or is it just the once to get here? Andrew smiled. Just the once. Don't worry. I've done since we arrived, and I don't know if I ever would again. My daughter did fine coming down the hill, but my poor wife shook for hours afterward. And you know how it is. We couldn't slow down because someone was afraid after coming down the hill. We had to keep going. There were many times we all needed a rest and kept going. Doris shook her head. It's a very hard journey. Is that why you decided to marry? You didn't want to have to continue to Oregon City? She shrugged. That was part of it. I had no idea the journey would be so taxing. Part of it is that I wanted to marry again. She turned from him and closed her eyes as she fibbed about having been married. And part of it was that I wanted to begin my future sooner if that makes sense. I didn't feel the need to go all that way, open a boarding house, and then start living. Andrew nodded. I understand. I'm glad we finished the journey because I have free land for myself and my animals but if I had thought I could start a farm without going all the way to Oregon City, I'd have done it in a heartbeat. Do you have favorite foods I could make for you? She asked, changing the subject. She wasn't ready to tell him yet that she'd fibbed about having been married. I like just about everything. I know Fiona has a good kitchen garden this year. I don't know if she's willing to share her bounty, but if she is, it would help us a lot. I wish I'd been here in the spring to plant one of our own, but it just didn't happen. Do we have money to buy the vegetables we need? Andrew shrugged. I do more trading than I do buying. I tend to keep whatever money I have for emergencies. Is there a bank in town? she asked. No, the town was founded by our company, so it's not even a year old yet. But barter is a great way of doing things here. 
you'll find that most of the farmers and the store in town will barter for what they need. He shrugged. I've eaten at the boarding house in town two meals a day since my daughter married. I trade the milk she needs for her daily cooking and baking for free meals. It works out well for both of us. Doris nodded, thinking about the money she had stashed away. If she needed to use some so he could hold on to his, she wouldn't complain. Finally, he pulled up in front of a small house. Though small, it looked like a very nice house to her. I expected to be living in a cabin. We lived in one last winter, and my wife died of pneumonia. This year, we'll be warm. He helped her out of the wagon and led her inside, so she could see the house he'd worked so hard to build. I moved in two weeks ago. She went toward the kitchen first and found a real stove there. You paid for a new stove, even though you didn't have a wife to cook for you? I paid for it so my daughter could cook for me, but she married before it arrived. Dora smiled. Isn't that how life goes? It does seem to be how my life goes. He shook his head. Nelida would have been so proud to use that stove, and I couldn't get one here until after she passed. Nelita was your wife? Doris asked. Andrew nodded. Yes, and she was a wonderful wife. I wish she could have had more children after Fiona, but we were a happy family. I'm sorry for your loss. I know you understand about loss. Knowing you had lost your husband made it easier to marry you. You'll have to tell me about him when you're ready. Which would never be, Doris thought. How was she ever going to be able to admit she'd never been married when she'd made it very clear she was a widow? She'd figure it out, and it would need to be soon. She opened one of the cabinets and exclaimed in delight. These are wonderful. I'll be able to keep so much right here in the kitchen. Did you make these? Andrew shook his head. That's one of the very few things I didn't make. A man in our company, who settled at the edge of town, made them for me. He's a furniture maker, so let me know if you see anything missing. We'll have him make it for us. So far, it looks like you thought of everything. She wandered to the dining room and then the parlor. This house is so cozy. I just love it. He showed her both bedrooms. This one was meant to be Fiona's, and when she announced she was marrying, I thought for a moment about making my bedroom larger, but then I thought it would be nice to have an extra room. Now it will be yours. Doris nodded, thrilled. He wanted a platonic marriage until they got to know one another better. She was certain it was partly due to his grief, but it did make things easier for her. It's perfect for me. Thank you. I'll go bring your trunk in, he said. Doris kept looking around. There was no more to the house than what she'd seen, but she kept seeing new details. She would enjoy making his little house a home. There were no curtains on the windows and no tablecloth yet. She could use some yard goods to take care of that. She had some she'd brought with her, thinking she would use them at her boarding house. Instead, she could make her new home as beautiful and cozy as possible without spending any money. She returned to the kitchen to explore and see what food he had on hand, but there was very little. There was some jerky in one of the cabinets, and she had a feeling he ate that for lunch daily. As soon as he brought her flour and sugar in, she would at least feel as if she had some things they needed. She would need to make some butter. Instead of trying to keep track of all the things to be done in her head, she found paper and pencil and got to work writing out a list of all the things she could do, and would need to do, to be able to cook in his kitchen. The following morning would need to be a boarding house morning, she was afraid, but hopefully, by the end of the day, she would be able to cook. She had a lot of work ahead of her, but she had time to do it. It would be wonderful being Andrew's wife and not just some fake widow, from the East. Chapter 2 When Doris woke the following morning, she got dressed, made her bed, and picked up her list of things she needed to do. The first needed to be shopping at the local general store so she would have food to fix for Andrew. When she walked out of her room, she saw Andrew was there waiting. 
Cows are milked. Are you ready to go to the boarding house for breakfast? He asked. She nodded. And this should be the last meal we have to eat there. I'll make sure to get what I need from the store today. I've got a credit at the store for milk. It's not a lot, but it should be enough. The owner's family appreciates fresh milk and cream delivered every other day. Do you do the deliveries yourself? He shrugged. I do the in-town deliveries myself, but most of the milk goes to a local dairy, and they pick it up themselves. I don't think there's anyone outside of town that doesn't have their own cow. Are we taking milk with us this morning? She asked. He nodded. We are. A full milk can for the boarding house and two large milk bottles for the store. If you can shop quickly, we can get all that done before heading home. Absolutely. I could start making butter and sell it as well. I'm sure Margaret at the boarding house would love that. Ask at the store if they'd like the same. It's always nice to have trades happening. Doris realized then her husband was going to be hard to part from his money. It was a good thing she had some of her own. He'd already loaded the milk onto the wagon, so it was just a matter of going. He handed her up, and they started the short journey into town. None of the houses were far from the others, because they knew they needed their community to survive. On the drive to town, he pointed out many things she'd been too tired to notice the night before. It was amazing how much energy she had after sleeping in a real bed for the first time in months. When they reached the boarding house, he walked straight to a small table in one corner of the main room. Almost immediately, a woman who had to be at least seven months along came to the table. Coffee? she asked. Doris nodded. Yes, always coffee. This is Margaret. She owns and runs the boarding house with the help of her husband, Jamie. It's good to meet you. Thanks for feeding us this morning. Mr. Jefferson more than makes up for the meals with the milk he trades. I hope there will still be trading happening. Doris hadn't considered that. I suppose there will be some. I'll probably cook most meals though. Margaret nodded as she hurried off to bring their coffee. Were you planning to continue eating here two meals per day? Doris asked Andrew. He shrugged. I hadn't really thought about it one way or the other. I suppose we can eat here when we want and at home when we want. Doris was disappointed. I think you're going to love my cooking. I certainly hope so, he said, grinning. But Margaret's one of the best cooks in the whole valley. We can lean on her some as you get used to life here. That's not a terrible idea, she said softly. I want to get a lot of sewing done in the next few days. I can plan to cook lunch every day. He grinned. I've been skipping lunch, so that would be wonderful. Why don't we keep eating breakfast and supper here as you settle in, and you can cook lunch for me? I have missed having a good midday meal. Dora smiled. She would have an opportunity to cook for him after all. When Margaret returned to the table with their breakfast and coffee, Doris asked about butter. You wouldn't be willing to trade for butter, would you? Oh, yes, I most definitely would. My husband has been helping me with it, as my girls are too small, so he'd be very happy to not have to churn any more butter for the rest of his life. I'll start bringing butter then. Could you use a full ball every day? Or less than that? Margaret clapped her hands as she put down their plates of bacon and pancakes. Oh, yes. A full ball a day would be perfect. I serve most meals with bread and butter, so it will save me a great deal of work. I'm happy to do it, Doris said with a smile. She'd always loved to churn butter, because she could churn with one hand while the other held a book. More than anything in the world, she loved to read. Hopefully, the butter would pay for an extra meal per day if they would still eat two meals a day there. The food was delicious. Oh, she is a good cook. Doris said. Andrew nodded. I'm sure you are too. I'll look forward to lunches at home. 
After breakfast, they headed to the store next door to the boarding house. The town blacksmith and his wife run this. He found he didn't have quite enough work in such a small town, so he opened the store here so he could make a little more. Well, that's nice, she said. Maybe they could use some butter as well. Doris quickly shopped, choosing food to make for their lunches. There were pies there as well. Who bakes the pies, she asked. The woman at the counter smiled, a baby cradled in one arm. I do. I love to bake. We have enough bachelors in the area, I wish I had time to bake bread as well, but I simply don't. Doris bit her lip. I could do bread and trade for things I need. Oh, that would be wonderful. You married Mr. Jefferson last night, right? I did. I'm Doris. It's so good to meet you, Doris. I'm Penelope Jensen. The blacksmith's wife? Penelope nodded. That's right. Well, how many loaves of bread would you like and how often? Penelope thought for a moment. Is six per day too many? Doris shook her head. No, we'll eat two meals daily in town, so I'm trying to fill the rest of my time, she said. I have some sewing to do in the next few days, but I don't know what to do with myself after that. You can only scrub a clean floor so often. Penelope laughed. Margaret is such a good cook. Herbert and I eat there more often than we should. Could you use butter as well? Doris asked. If Andrew wanted to trade, that was great, but she would help in every way she could. She was not a woman used to sitting idle while others worked. Maybe a ball of butter per week. I don't like to sell things that are better if kept cold. I understand that perfectly. Could I bring a ball of butter every Monday? Would that work? Penelope nodded, smiling. I think we're going to have a good business relationship. Welcome to our valley. I've never even dreamed I could live in such a beautiful place. You'll love it here. The people are just as wonderful as the land. I look forward to Sunday when I'll meet more people. Doris carefully chose what she would need for lunch for the next two days, and the items were put onto her account. Andrew already had dishes, pots, and pans. All they needed was food to put on and in them. On the drive home, Doris talked about how much she'd enjoyed getting to know the young women of the valley. Please tell me there are some ladies that are closer to my age, though. Andrew smiled, nodding. Yes, there are several ladies nearer to your age. When he dropped her off, she immediately started her daily baking. As much as she loved cooking and baking, she was happy to have found an outlet for her talents. She wondered if she could also bake cakes for the store, but she didn't want to seem too greedy for money. Though she was certain they could easily make it on the trades Andrew had set up, it felt good not to be a burden on him. She made a simple shepherd's pie for lunch, hoping it wouldn't be too heavy of a meal, because she knew he had to be out in the sun working yet. Thankfully, now that it was September, it was getting cooler during the day, and since she was no longer driving her wagon everywhere, it should be much easier to get things done. When Andrew came in at noon for the meal, she served the shepherd's pie with a fresh loaf of bread. Other loaves were cooling around the kitchen. Andrew smiled when he saw what she'd fixed. That looks and smells delicious. He took a deep sniff. You have no idea how much I've missed the smell of baking bread in my home. I love baking. There was no time to make a cake today, but there will be many cakes, pies, and cookies in our future and I will have milk to go with all of it. They had a light conversation as they ate their meal together. I'm working on my winter pasture for the cows. A neighbor is trading corn for milk, and I'm thrilled for the trade. The corn will feed the cows all winter, nourishing them so they can make the milk he wants. Should I offer to add butter to our deal? If you think he'd like that, she said. I really do enjoy churning butter, even though my arms get tired from it. Is it asking too much to add it? he asked, concerned. He had seen his wife hurt herself with all the chores around the house, 
and he didn't want to see the same thing with Doris. Not at all. The store only wants one ball of butter per week, so I'll be making one for us, one for Penelope, and seven for the boarding house. That's only nine per week. I did twenty-one per week at home. You made butter back east? Doris wished she hadn't said so much. Yes, for a little extra income. It may take me a little while to build up those muscles in my arms again, but I don't think so. Not with all the driving I've been doing. He nodded. That drive was difficult. You were a widow when you left Independence, he asked. She nodded reluctantly. Perhaps keeping up the lie would be a problem. I, she started, ready to confess to the truth. I need to get back out there. I dawdled too long. Thanks for the wonderful lunch, Doris. With that, he disappeared out the front door, and she sighed. She'd have to tell him another time. She simply worried that the longer she kept up the pretense, the harder it would be to admit to the truth. She cleaned up their lunch dishes and took what was left of the shepherd's pie to the cellar. It would keep cool enough there they could have it again. Or if he had chickens, she could feed the food to them. She promised herself she'd ask that as they drove into town for supper. The rest of her afternoon was spent churning butter. She wanted to be able to deliver the first ball to Margaret at supper time. It would show she had every intention of keeping her word. She made two balls that afternoon. One would last at least a week at home, and the other would go to Margaret at supper. She wrapped the bread and cloth to take to the store the following morning. She certainly hoped what she was doing would make her less of a burden on Andrew. Doris found herself anticipating his return. She'd never spent so much time alone, except when she'd been driving on the trail, and most of that had been spent worrying about her future. It would be good to spend time with him when he returned from his day of work. She found Andrew to be an attractive man. She hadn't really the night before when they'd married, but as she'd gotten to know what a good man he was, he'd gotten more and more attractive. He came in from work shortly before five. Are you ready? he asked. She nodded, taking the ball of butter she'd made for the boarding house. She had it in a small pot that had a lid over it. She wasn't certain how Margaret wanted her to provide it, but this would work the first time. The entire drive to town, Andrew talked about his day, and she barely had a chance to get a word in edgewise, which was odd to her. He'd seemed like such a quiet man the night before. Once they were at the boarding house, she gave Margaret the pot with the butter in it, and Margaret brought her back the pot a moment later. Thank you so much. I'm so excited that I don't have to wear myself out churning butter anymore. In your condition, you should take a break from difficult tasks like that anyway. Oh, but I'm not going to take up the task again after the baby is born. You will be churning my butter for as long as I can convince you to do it. Doris laughed. I churned three balls of butter a day back home. And even with not churning more for a good long while, I found that the driving had kept my arms ready for churning. Good. I'm going to keep counting on you then. Margaret smiled, seemingly very pleased with the deal she'd made. Coffee, milk, or water, she asked. Milk, Doris answered immediately. She drank coffee in the mornings, but afternoon, she had to switch if she wanted to get any sleep that night. All right. I'll be back in a minute. Margaret brought the milk and put bowls of stew over rice in front of them. Enjoy. And thanks again. Doris took a bite and smiled. She's a better cook than I am. I don't think I've ever said those words aloud before. Andrew patted her hand. You're a good cook too. She stared at his hand where it covered hers for a moment. It was the first time he'd voluntarily touched her other than helping her in and out of the wagon. It felt odd, but right all at the same time. She was married, and her life was different. Chapter 3 Sunday morning dawned, and Doris was awake to watch the sunrise. They would again go to the boarding house for breakfast, but afterward, they'd go to church. 
Doris couldn't wait for church because she would meet so many people in the community that she'd chosen to be part of. She enjoyed the breakfast at the boarding house as always, and the church service afterward made her smile. Well, until the sermon started, anyway. The sermon was on honesty, and Doris felt as if Pastor Scott was looking straight into her soul, seeing her lies, and finding her lacking. The lie that had made so much sense to her when they'd started West seemed a huge burden now. After the service, where she met what seemed to be every woman in the community, they made the short drive home. Once there, Doris reheated the food from the day before for lunch. As they ate, she asked, Do we have chickens? Andrew nodded. We do. Only five of them right now, but they are growing quickly. Soon we'll have enough that we can process the pullets for food. Right now, I don't think that's possible yet, though. Makes sense. Do any of them lay yet? No, but they should be in a few months, according to Fiona. I met Fiona that first night, but only had a chance to speak with her briefly at church this morning. Doris wanted to get to know his only child. The little she'd seen of her was delightful. Oh, I talked to both her and Sam this morning. They plan to come over this afternoon. They are excited about Sadie's pups. Sadie? My dog. She's going to have pups any day, and they want to see her and talk to her. They have announced they're getting at least one of the pups for the ranch, but they're hoping for two. I guess it depends on how many Sadie has. What kind of dog is Sadie? She's a mutt, which is perfect here. She's great for helping me move the cattle from one area to the next. Hopefully, by next summer, we'll have farmhands around to help. I think that would be good. Will you provide housing for them? He shook his head. No, we have a boarding house in town. They can stay at Margaret's and eat there. Then I don't have to worry about housing or food. It would be nice to have a foreman live in the cabin, though. Have you done anything to hire a foreman? He shook his head. I'll start advertising for someone in the spring. Right now we're just keeping all cows and butchering the steers. Keeping our primary bull for breeding, but we don't need other males. They just need to be fattened up to be sold at market. When is the market? she asked. He shrugged. Probably next summer. I have butchered a few steers already. We should have more than we can use by next summer, though. Do you share the meat? Doris asked. Andrew nodded. I share with Fiona and her in-laws now. They bring me some of the game they kill and some of the yield from their kitchen gardens. I think that's a lot of the reason Fiona will be here today. She'll want to get to know you and drop off some of their vegetables from the garden. I look forward to getting to know her and Sam. Sam's a good husband to her. Initially, I was a bit worried, but he's made her very happy. That's good to know. Doris said. I want to meet Sadie as well. Sadie's been hiding in the barn most of her time lately. She's getting anxious about those puppies making an appearance. Doris was washing the lunch dishes when Fiona came into the house. Without a word, Fiona took an apron hanging from a nail on the wall and put it on, immediately wiping the dishes that had already been washed. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get away yesterday, Fiona said. Melody's feet are covered in bloody blisters. We helped her around the house instead of making it here to visit. I'm excited to get to know you. I feel the same. I brought plenty of vegetables from the garden. You'll want to put them up. If you need my help, just let me know. Doris laughed. I'm pretty self-sufficient. I'm selling butter and bread in town now, for extra money. Fiona shook her head, lowering her voice to a whisper. Don't let Pa fool you. He has plenty of money hidden away. He just likes to be able to make more. Don't we all? Doris asked. I don't mind helping with household money. I only have him and me to care for, so I'll get bored quickly otherwise. Anything to help you alleviate boredom then? 
Fiona yawned behind her hand. Sorry. We've kept busy all summer with our garden. I planted strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries. As they're all perennials, we didn't yield from them this year, but next summer and fall, we will be covered in berries. Wonderful. I do like to bake lots and lots of pies. I'm baking bread for the store and providing butter to the boarding house daily. Good for you. Are you doing it for trade or money? Trade. Your pa thinks we should still eat two meals a day at the boarding house, so he's thrilled to build up as much in trade as he can. Do you not cook? Fiona asked, her brows narrowing. She'd specifically asked the two women who had joined their community if they could cook. I do. But Margaret is better, and I can't deny that. I've always considered myself the best cook, but she is phenomenal. Fiona nodded. I can't argue with that, and I'm sure Pa is being stubborn about it as he is with everything else. Your Pa is stubborn? Doris asked. It was a side she had yet to see of her husband. Laughing, Fiona said, just wait until you've been married for a little while. You'll see just how stubborn he is. I'll look forward to that, Doris said with a grin. He tells me you want to see Sadie and make sure she's doing all right. Yes, Fiona said. But I also wanted to bring you some of my harvest. We're hoping Sadie will have a good eight or nine pups so we can have two. Have you gotten to meet Sadie yet? Doris shook her head. No, but your father said she was hiding in the barn as she waits for the babies to be born. That's where I'll go see her then. There's no reason to make her come to us. Fiona wiped the last dish and put it into the cabinet. This house is beautiful. Pa did a wonderful job on it. He did, Doris agreed. Did you ever get a chance to live here? Fiona shook her head. No. He finished just a couple of weeks ago, and I was married in late spring. For some reason, Doris liked knowing she was the only woman to have lived in the house. She knew it wouldn't truly matter one way or the other, but being the first felt good. Do you mind if I rearrange the kitchen to my liking? Doris asked. She knew Fiona had set up the kitchen and most of the house. It would be rude to simply start changing things. Not at all. This is your home. Fiona said. My pa may live here, but it's never been a real home to me. I lived in the cabin for a while, but that never felt like home either. They entered the parlor to join the men and found them standing up, ready to go outside. Are we looking at Sadie? Fiona asked. Andrew nodded. Sure. We'll go see her. He led the way out to the barn, with Sam, beside him. Fiona and Doris were in the back. They found Sadie in an empty stall in the barn, lying on her side amid the hay, ten small puppies wiggling as they tried to nurse. Oh, they're beautiful, Doris exclaimed. She knew the puppies were at a premium, but wanted to keep one for herself. Doris dropped to her knees in the hay, aware that Fiona was beside her. I want to keep them all. Fiona said. Andrew shook his head. No, you're not keeping them all. But if all ten live, you can take two. Oh, thank you, Pa. We need them to help with the cattle. Bastian has already decided he wants one of them to live with him in the cabin once Jacob and Melody move into the house they're building. And where will the other one stay? Doris asked. With me, of course. Fiona grabbed one of the squirming puppies and held it under her chin, snuggling it close. There are so many colors. All the dogs had short hair, but one was white with black spots, another was pure black, and another was gray. It was bound to be this way, Andrew said. We know Sadie is a mixed-breed dog, and we have no idea who the father of the puppies is. He reached down and lifted the gray one. These look like they could be half-wolf, which wouldn't surprise me a bit. When it was time to return to the house, Doris wanted to stay with the puppies, but she knew better. 
It would be best if she stayed with Fiona, getting to know the girl as much as possible. Fiona returned to the kitchen and the basket of food she'd brought. I have carrots, potatoes, peppers, pears, pumpkin, and squash. I also have a couple of cantaloupes if you eat them. Paul won't. Thank you so much. Doris dug through the basket. Cucumbers. I love to make pickles. I wonder how they'd go at the store. No point in doing pickles, Fiona said. Penelope makes pickles and sells them as well as her pies. Well, I can still make some to share with you then, can't I? Of course. Fiona said. Sam loves pickles. Dill or sweet? Both. I think he'd eat pickles for every meal if he could get away with it. When it was time to head into town for supper, Andrew asked if the other two wanted to go with them. My treat. Fiona shook her head. No, I have plans for supper. Thanks for the visit. To Doris's surprise, Fiona hugged her. I'm glad you married my pa, she said softly. I think I am, too, Doris replied. Before they left, Doris retrieved the other butterball she had in the cellar, planning to take it to Margaret. She loved the idea of trading services almost as much as Andrew did. Of course, Andrew was tight-fisted, and she didn't tend to be, but she'd learned to do things the way her husband would like. Margaret was serving roast beef and mashed potatoes, and the food was incredible. You need to share some of your receipts with me, Dora said when the younger woman came to check on them halfway through the meal. Margaret laughed. I don't know about you, but when I cook, I add a little of this, and a little of that, until it tastes right. I don't have any real receipts. Doris nodded. I'm the same unless I'm baking. And sometimes I do things that way when I bake as well. I heard you're baking for the store. I wish you'd talk to me first. I sure would have let you bake bread for me. Doris bit her lip, looking at Andrew, who nodded. How many loaves would you need per day? I'm only baking six per day for the store. Margaret's eyes narrowed. Would ten be too many? she asked. Not at all. Why don't I bring one loaf tomorrow, so you can make sure you're happy with it, and then I'll start doing ten per day for you. I'd need them here by six in the morning every day. That would be fine. I can mix the dough the night before and let it rise in the cellar overnight. It always takes longer when it's cooler. Then I just have to be up by four to bake it. Andrew is up that early for milking anyway. Margaret nodded, looking relieved. This far into my pregnancy, everything I do seems almost impossible, she said. I was never this big with the girls. I'll help in any way I can. I love to bake, and if we're eating here in town twice a day, it'll be nice to contribute to the meals we eat. And it will help me so much. I'll look forward to tasting your first loaf tomorrow, and if it goes well, I'll expect ten loaves on Tuesday. Sounds wonderful. As Margaret walked away, Andrew smiled. We don't need that much extra. Doris shrugged. I won't feel like I'm a burden on you if I can keep busy with cooking. Andrew gave her a look that surprised her. She wasn't exactly sure what it meant, but it seemed to be, well, interested in her womanly attributes. In all her life, she'd never received a look like that from a man. She took a deep breath, deciding to tell him her secret on the way home. He needed to know the truth before he developed feelings for her. Andrew was particularly chatty on the way home, telling her how excited he was that she was fitting in so well. Fiona already seems attached to you. I'm surprised to see her feel something quickly, because she was close to her mother. I want to be close to Fiona. She'll be the mother of our grandchildren. Doris had always regretted not having children, and the idea of grandchildren made her heart flutter, just a little. I need. Anything you need you can get from the store in the morning. Will you get up early tomorrow to bake the bread? he asked. I will. But I need to tell you. You don't have to tell me anything, 
he said. I'm so pleased with you, I just can't express it. You're exactly what I needed in a life. And your cooking is wonderful. Just not as good as Margaret's? Doris asked. No one cooks quite as well as Margaret does. That woman must have been born with an iron skillet growing out of her hand. Doris laughed. Obviously, this wasn't the right time to explain her deceit to him. But she had to tell him soon. Chapter 4 After Andrew and Doris returned home after supper, he asked if she had time for a walk or if she needed to get to work doing the things she'd promised to have done the following day. I must get the dough mixed and divided for bread tomorrow. I wish I had time for a walk. Work needs to come first, he said, believing his words. I need to milk the cows anyway. While Andrew milked, Doris mixed up a huge batch of bread to take it to the store in the morning and also provide a sample for Margaret. She didn't doubt Margaret would want to use her bread because she had been making bread most of her life. She carried the individual loaf pans downstairs once the dough was ready to rise and portioned out. She only had ten pans total, but it would be easy enough to buy a few more the following day. Knowing she'd get her money back on them made it a good idea to buy them. She was waiting in the parlor when Andrew came back inside, hoping he would listen to her about her deception. She had never intended to deceive Andrew, just the wagon train, and only then, because it had felt necessary. Surely her new husband would be able to understand her reasons for telling the biggest fib of her life. Andrew took one step into the parlor and frowned. I'm sorry, but I'm too tired to stay awake. Do you mind if I just go to sleep? he asked. Of course not. I need to be up early in the morning, so we'll simply go to bed. Dora stood and walked toward him, meaning to go past him and head to her bed. She was surprised when he reached out and caught her shoulders, brushing a soft kiss against her lips. She was even more astonished at how much she enjoyed the kiss. She'd never had a beau or a man who had dared try to kiss her, so this kiss from her husband after over forty years of being alone simply felt right. Wrapping her arms around him, she gave in to the feelings she was developing for Andrew. When he finally raised his head, she could still feel the kiss all the way down to her toes. Never would she have guessed that a man could make her feel so many things all at once. Good night, Doris, Andrew said softly as he went to his room. Doris went to her own, knowing she had to be up early, but after that kiss, she spent too much time staring up at the ceiling and imagining a real marriage with a man who loved her. She certainly hoped it could happen. Early the following morning, Andrew knocked on her door on his way to milk. Time to get up and bake, he said. Doris groaned and sat up in bed. I'll be out in a minute or two. She had never been particularly fond of mornings, and now having to wake before the sun was even thinking of rising, well, it felt like too much. When she was dressed, she left her room, going straight to the stove to start the fire within it. Then she went down the stairs into the cellar to fetch the loaves of bread she had rising. She'd done ten total, knowing she and Andrew would need some with the lunch she served, whatever that happened to be. She took the large basket Fiona had brought produce in and filled it with the loaves of bread, each of them wrapped in a piece of cloth. She would need to churn butter that afternoon and a lot of it. Doris hoped she hadn't bitten off more than she could chew with all the extra baking she was doing but she had a feeling that the work would keep her happy. She didn't need her mind to be idle or her hands either. Andrew came inside with their milk for the day and set it on the counter. I already have Margaret's milk in the wagon. Are you about ready? Doris nodded, feeling embarrassed to be with him this morning, after their kiss of the night before. Though she looked forward to a real marriage with him, she wasn't sure she'd make it through the embarrassment to get to that point. She hefted the basket with all the bread, and Andrew immediately took it from her. You don't need to carry such heavy things, he said. I suppose I don't. No one had ever been so kind as to carry things for her. A few men on the trail had done their best to make her work easier, but for the most part, 
It had only been her and her mother for her entire life. She followed him out to the wagon, closing the door behind them, and waited until he'd settled the bread in the back, so he could help her up. He'd gotten into the habit of treating his first wife well, and she was thrilled he was treating her the same way. As they drove, he talked about Sadie's puppies and how they ate well. We'll keep one, he said. You'll get your pick of the litter. Also, let's save any table scraps for Sadie while she's nursing them. I get to keep a puppy, she asked. Her life hadn't been bleak, but hadn't been filled with little privileges either. To her, owning a dog was a true privilege and one she was excited about. If you wanted to, you could keep them all, but I promised most of them to people in town. Ten would be a few too many. I'd love to keep one, though. Can it be inside as well as outside? she asked. Of course. Whatever you like. Just know that puppies are sometimes hard to house train. That won't bother me at all, she said. She practically danced into the boarding house, giving Margaret the loaf of bread she'd brought. She had always put a bit of butter on the top of the bread before baking, making the bread so much better. Margaret brought them coffee before carrying the bread into the kitchen to try it for herself. When she brought their breakfast out, she had a huge smile. If you can handle ten loaves daily, I would be grateful. Oh, of course. I'm thrilled to do it. Doris couldn't believe how pleased she was that she could help this woman, whom she'd known for just a few days. Thank you so much. I don't know what I did before you came here. Exactly what you had to do, Doris said with a smile. My husband said to thank you for him. He's thrilled not to have to churn butter after farming all day. Who minds your children while you work? Doris asked. Oh, they play in the kitchen. I have a table in there, and I put down different things for them to do while I work. Since I only do two meals per day, they only have four hours to stay entertained, and I'm right there if they need me. That sounds like a good solution to me. It works well. My daughters are very well behaved. Margaret hurried off to fill someone's coffee cup and Doris shook her head. She does so much for so many. I can't help but admire her. She told me she's always loved to cook, Andrew said. She was very happy to trade milk for meals, and now bread and butter for meals. I'm glad we don't have to pay extra for you to eat here. While they ate the French toast Margaret had made, Doris's mind was again on trying to decide what to do about the lie Andrew still believed. It was time she told him, but the boarding house was not the place to do it. Are you just dropping off bread today, or do you need something else? he asked. I need to buy a few more bread pans. I'll be making as many as twenty loaves of bread per day, and I would like to not have to use the same pan over and over. He nodded. That would be good. You should get some meat for lunch there as well. I do enjoy our quiet lunches at home. So do I, Doris replied, truly enjoying everything about her marriage, to this man. Would you mind if we had something simple like bacon sandwiches for lunch? Not at all. I like my bacon extra crisp. As far as I'm concerned, it's not edible any other way, she said with a grin. At the store, she quickly found what she was looking for, and she even found two little crocks to carry butter to the restaurant in. They would be perfect for the job, and she wouldn't have to constantly use her small pot for butter. When she talked to Penelope, the other woman was thrilled to have the bread. I'll let you know if this is enough. I've never sold bread. I can easily make more if you need it, Doris said, thinking of the extra time she would be needing bread, but it would help her to not feel like a burden. For the first time in her life, she felt as if she was doing all she could to be productive. Thank you. I'll take you up on that once I determine how much we'll need. Andrew came in then, with two large milk jugs. Let me know if you need more. Penelope smiled. I will. I can't believe how much milk I'm drinking right now. Herbert keeps laughing at me, but I don't mind even a little. I'll have your butter this evening when we come in for supper, Doris said. 
Wonderful. Thank you both. Doris left the store with food for their meals for the next couple of days and all the bread pans she needed. It would be exciting to learn how quickly her loaves of bread were sold. On the drive home, Andrew told her what he would be doing for the day, and she was again unable to tell him about her lie. She wanted to get it off her chest, but he always talked about something else. She was surprised when he kissed her as he left for the day, but his kisses were getting increasingly familiar, and she was feeling more and more comfortable with them. Instead of starting on the chores she needed to do immediately, she went out to check on the puppies. Sadie kept looking at her as if she thought Doris could help her. Doris stroked the dog's head and ears, talking to her softly. You're a good mama, Sadie. We're going to keep one of your puppies so you can always be together. Won't that be nice? After playing with the puppies, she went inside, made the beds, and washed the bread pans from that morning. Then she pulled out the butter churn and went to work on the butter. She wanted two balls done before supper, and that would take around an hour. But there were so many other things she wanted to do as well. She made Andrew three bacon sandwiches, but only one for herself. She knew he was doing much harder work than she was. As they ate their lunch, he talked about how much he enjoyed her company, and how happy he was that she'd agreed to marry him. Dora smiled and told him the same thing, but in the back of her mind, she couldn't help but wonder if he was going to hate her when she told him the truth about herself. What had seemed like a wonderful idea in independence, now felt like a curse. She had to tell him before bed that night, no matter how difficult it was to get him to listen to her. The rest of her day was spent churning butter and putting up some of the vegetables Fiona had brought the previous day. She hoped there would be fresh game soon as well, so she could have it ready for the winter. She knew the store wouldn't be able to keep fresh meat for long. The house was spotless when Andrew came in from milking that afternoon. Doris was thrilled with how much work Fiona had done to keep it tidy. She could already see that it had been plenty of work for the girl, because Andrew wasn't in the habit of picking up after himself. He glanced at her when he walked in. I'm hungry. Are you ready to go to town? She nodded, getting the two balls of butter and carrying them to the door, where he took them from her. You should just ask me to carry heavy things, he said softly. The butter isn't all that heavy, she replied. It is too heavy for a lady to carry on her own, and that's that. Doris nodded. All right. I'll ask next time. Thank you, Andrew said, leaning down and kissing her cheek. Let's get this butter to town. We need to be there before the store closes at five. I'm ready, she told him. And she was sure she was ready to go to town, but even more than that, she was ready to tell him the truth about herself. It was going to happen before bed, or she would lose her mind. She delivered the butter to the store and then to Margaret, who brought them milk without being asked. Pork chops tonight, she said. I'm going to send Jamie out for some deer tomorrow. I would love some venison stew. Dora smiled, nodding. I love venison stew and I haven't had it since I was a little girl. After my father died, there was no more venison. Margaret frowned. I even made it on the trail. I'll give you an extra large portion. The pork chops and baked potatoes that were for supper that night were delicious. Doris had never loved pork chops, but whatever Margaret had used to season them was wonderful. Do you have any pigs? Doris asked as she dug into her plate of food. Andrew shook his head. Not yet. I may get some in a few years, though. I need to ensure the dairy farm is established and ready to support us first. Doris couldn't help but smile. The man was so careful with his money and his future. She was happy to help in every way she possibly could. If he kept her around after he heard about her lie, Chapter 5 On the drive home from Clover Creek, Andrew once again talked about his day and his dreams for his dairy farm. Doris knew she had to start mixing the bread dough as soon as she got home, 
and she truly hoped she could talk to him about her life first. She listened, nodding, and finally, when he started talking about his hopes to have pigs on the farm within the next five years, she knew it was time to cut into the mostly one-sided conversation. Andrew, I need to tell you something. Andrew became quiet, seeming to be shocked that she'd said that. What about? When I met you, I was introduced as a widow. I let the company think of me as a widow because I thought I would have less unwanted attention from men on the trail if I was a widow. Are you saying you're married? He asked, looking appalled. Well, I am married, but I'm married to you. The truth is, I've spent the last twenty years taking care of my mother, who was sickly her entire life. She died less than a year ago, and that's when I started planning my journey west. I've never married. I've never even had a beau. Why didn't you tell me before? Before we married? I was afraid to that first night. I didn't want anyone from the company I was with to hear, and then they'd all think less of me for lying. Then we married, and I've been trying to tell you since, but, well, it's been hard. You talk about your goals and our future, and I love to listen. But I haven't had much chance to tell you anything. I see. Andrew wasn't sure how he felt about her never having married. And you're telling me now for what reason? Because I have no desire to have lies between us. I'm developing feelings for you very quickly, and I don't want my deceit to be a wall between us and our eventual happiness. Andrew nodded as he stared straight ahead, driving home in full sunlight because it got dark late in the day where they lived. Let me think on it. I'm not going to reject you because you presented yourself as a widow, but I need to think about how I feel about it. Lying is a sin, and you've been lying to me since before we married. It may be hard for me to trust you again. I can understand that. Thank you for not immediately rejecting me. The worst part of it for Andrew was knowing he was now married to a virgin. A widow would be easier to make love with the first time but a woman in her forties who was still a virgin? That was something else altogether. He was silent for the rest of the drive home, and Doris felt more and more nervous about what his reaction would be. Perhaps he would think it was all fine, and not be upset at all, but there was a good chance he would find his way to anger. She hurried into the house, not waiting for him to help her down from the wagon and started to work immediately on the bread she needed to make for the following day. As she dug her fingers into the dough, she tried to not think about Andrew at all, but that was impossible. He was disappointed in her. She'd seen it on his face. She only hoped the two of them could get past her fib and become a true married couple, with love and intimacy. She heard Andrew enter the house, but then she heard his bedroom door close. He wouldn't talk to her again tonight, and there would be no goodnight kisses. Tears streamed down her face as she divided the dough and put it into individual pans. She only hoped they wouldn't have a marriage of convenience for long, because she was already in love with Andrew. That had to count for something, didn't it? Andrew was very quiet for most of the week. He would talk when she spoke first, but simply to answer questions. He was still mulling over what she'd told him and trying to decide how he felt about it. By Saturday, Doris was told the store needed ten loaves of bread per day. Since she wanted a loaf a day for her and Andrew, she bought one more bread pan, but their credit at the store was growing daily. It felt good to contribute, even as she waited to talk to Andrew about what she'd told him. On Sunday afternoon, Fiona and Sam came to visit again, and even Fiona noticed that there was something wrong between her father and his new wife. Why is Pa acting so strange, she asked. He seemed so happy the last time we were here, but now he doesn't seem to want to talk to you at all. Doris frowned. Let it be. You know what's wrong? Fiona pushed. I do, and I beg you to just let it be. We'll work it out on our own. Fiona frowned. All right. I just wish I could help in some way. I appreciate that, Doris said. She wiped her hands dry on her apron after washing the last dish. I have scraps to take to Sadie. 
I've been cooking a little extra every day so I could give her more food. I think that's wonderful. Fiona smiled at her stepmother. I went to the store yesterday, and they asked if I wanted to use any of your credit, because you were building it up faster than you could spend it. Doris laughed at that. I'm just doing what I can to help your father with the finances. Which is great, but Pa doesn't need help. Anything could happen, Doris said softly. Having money set aside will only help us. I guess, Fiona said. Let's go see the puppies. Pa said you get first pick. Have you chosen a favorite yet? I think I want the little gray one, Doris said, surprised that Andrew remembered his promise. He's a sweetheart, Fiona agreed. Walking into the parlor, she said, we're going to see the puppies. Sam got to his feet. Not without me or not. As they walked to the barn, Doris hoped she would be able to get Andrew to speak with her soon. They had to be able to talk through what she'd told him. It had already been six days. Exactly how long did the man need to think about how he felt about her never having been married? It made no sense that he was so quiet about it. In the barn, Sadie was excited to get the food, stood up, and the puppies fell off her. While she went to eat, they looked at the puppies, and Doris said, I want the gray one. I don't have a name for him yet, but he's mine. Andrew nodded. We'll come up with a name. He said nothing else, though, and Doris was certain he was simply going to stop talking to her at all soon. She'd really messed up by not telling him the truth sooner. She should have just told him she had something important to say instead of waiting as long as she had. The other couple went to supper with them that evening, and they had a wonderful meal of ham, creamed potatoes, and corn. This is delicious as always, Doris told Margaret. Margaret smiled. I do my best. Fiona and Sam had driven their own wagon to the boarding house, so Doris and Andrew were alone on the way home. As soon as they were out of earshot of his daughter and her husband, Andrew asked, Did you tell Fiona why we're not getting along? He asked. She asked me, and I told her to mind her own business. I told her to let it be. It's not any of her business why we're having trouble, and I wouldn't try to sway her opinion. Thank you for that, Andrew said. I don't want my daughter in the middle of it. I don't want her there either. But I wish I knew where I stood. It's been six days since I talked to you, and you haven't said much to me since then. He sighed. I'm still really trying to decide how I feel. I don't like that you thought you needed to lie, but I think I can understand why. I just wish you'd told me sooner, like the night we were married. It makes it hard to trust you now. Doris nodded. I understand. She wished it wasn't so, but she did understand. So where do we go from here? I'm not certain yet. I'm not going to get our marriage annulled or get a divorce. But I thought we were taking our time and having feelings for one another grow, and that couldn't be the case if you weren't being honest with me. Doris bit her lip, deciding to put it all on the line. I do have feelings for you, Andrew. They've grown a little more each day. I know you can't completely trust me now, but I hope you'll be able to in the future, because I would like for us to have a real marriage. He looked over at her for a moment before nodding. I'd like that too. I think. I know it's hard to deal with, but you need to let me know how you feel and what you want to do about it. All right. He pulled the wagon into the yard and jumped down, going around to help her down. I'm going to put the horses up for the night and milk the cows. Does it matter that you always seem to milk them later in the day on Sundays? She asked. He shook his head. Doesn't seem to. Doris went inside to get the dough prepped for the morning's baking. Perhaps she and Andrew could spend a few minutes together after they were both finished with the chores at hand. When she climbed the cellar stairs and walked to the parlor, he was sitting there, staring off into space. Usually, he read or whittled, but that day, well, he had too much on his mind, and Doris knew it was because of her. 
She went into the parlor and sat beside him on the sofa, putting her hand over his on his knee. I'm very sorry I didn't tell you sooner, and I hope that someday you'll be able to forgive me and trust me again. He looked at her, his brows furrowed. I have already forgiven you, he said softly. The trust is what's going to be hard to come by. What can I do to prove I won't lie to you again? She wanted to point out that she'd never really lied to him. No, it had been a lie carried over from when she hadn't been able to trust the company she'd joined. I don't think there is anything. We'll just have to muddle through and see how things go. She sighed deeply. I wish I had answers. I do as well, but it is what it is. She decided to go out on a limb and say something he wouldn't expect. I miss your kisses, she said softly. He stared at her for a moment, slowly lowering his head and brushing his lips across hers. Then his hands went to her waist and he pulled her closer, deepening the kiss. Soon, the kiss was more than she'd ever experienced before, but instead of wanting him to stop, she wanted to see where the kiss would lead. It seemed odd that they would make love when she was obviously too old for childbearing, but perhaps they could do it because they cared for one another. She didn't know if that was done, but she wouldn't object to seeing for herself. Andrew pulled her onto his lap and moved his hands to cup her breast, never breaking the kiss. Doris felt things she'd never imagined she would feel, including a tingling in her stomach and an ache between her thighs. Maybe she couldn't have children, but she was enjoying this too much to stop. Andrew lifted his head and looked into her eyes. If you're going to tell me to stop, you need to tell me now. Otherwise, I'm taking you to my bed and making you my wife in every way. Doris looked deeply into his blue eyes. Please don't stop. Andrew didn't have to be told twice. He pushed her onto the couch beside him and then took her hand, pulling her toward his bedroom. Within moments, he had them both completely naked, and he was pushing her down onto the bed. He continued kissing her instead of climbing atop her immediately as she'd expected him to do. His hands were all over her body, even at the ache in an area no man had ever touched. When he moved one finger inside her, she let out a gasp of shock that quickly turned to pleasure. She clenched herself around his finger, enjoying the feel of it inside her. When he covered her with his body and joined them as one, Doris wrapped her arms around him and held on for dear life. His movements inside her were more than she'd ever expected. Soon he'd finished and rolled to her side, leaving her wanting, something. It had felt good, but it wasn't quite enough. He seemed to know though, because as soon as he caught his breath again, there was a finger inside her that was quickly joined by another. His hand made her feel so much, and she gasped, clasping him tightly inside her. He held her close as she found her release, and he kept her close even as he was falling asleep. Doris hadn't expected to feel so much with him. She would thought he'd find pleasure in her arms, but it had never occurred to her that a woman could find pleasure in a man's arms. She settled down close to him, her head on his shoulder. She could get used to being a wife if it meant feeling as she felt at that moment. The only thing that kept her from complete happiness was she didn't know if he'd ever trust her again. She wanted him to, but she'd made a mistake, and she would have to continue to wait as she found out whether or not he believed that she could be trusted. She closed her eyes and sighed contentedly. Even if he never trusted her, if they could just keep things as they were, she would have a good marriage. Hopefully, he would learn that she was not the type of person who lied easily, but if he didn't, she was determined to be happy with him anyway.